chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 27 through 32. You have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorcement. But I say to you that whosoever divorces his wife, except it be for fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whoso marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now, uh, I may have made mention of this a couple of weeks ago at the outset of this class, uh, but uh, I think it bears repeating. You know, this is, this is the first recorded sermon of the Lord. That's not the first sermon we know He was preaching in Matthew chapter 4, Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. We don't know what else He said. We know that He was teaching, that He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom in the synagogues, right? In Matthew 4, beginning in verse 23. Uh, and, but this is that first actual recorded sermon uh, that we have. I think it's extremely safe to say that this sermon was repeated for the better part of a year and a half or two years as Jesus made His way through Galilee and through Judea and the various regions where He traveled. Uh, because this is the Sermon on the Mount. And in Luke 6, we have what's called the Sermon on the Plain. And there are at least five major themes in Matthew that are found, that are found in Luke. And so they were not the same sermon. Not the same sermon. I mean, not the same event. But the sermon was preached in, in other places at, at other times. And so these were things of, of utmost importance that Jesus wanted uh, uh, the Jews to know. And it's, it, I think it's important for us to think about the fact that Jesus addressed the subject of marriage and the subject of adultery and the subject of divorce in this uh, what we might say in this foundational sermon that he preached everywhere, likely everywhere he went. And so, and if it was important enough to be preached then, it's certainly important enough to be preached now. Uh, you know, sometimes we, sometimes we can be uh, deceived into thinking that things have never been as bad with regard to marriage as they are right now. But the very fact that this sermon was preached at this time, at this juncture in the ministry of Jesus, tells us that that is not true. That there have always been difficulties, uh, for the most part, with the subject of divorce. Uh, and as we uh, look, if we were to look through, you know, there are three there are three texts in the New Testament that speak uh, that where Jesus is referenced. Uh, as speaking to this matter. One of those is this text that we just read. The second is Matthew 19, 9. Or Matthew 19, 4 through 9. Or actually, we go through past, all the way through verse 12. If we, if we want to take the entire context, we go Matthew 19, 3 through 12, where Jesus taught about marriage in that context and, uh, and said, you know, whosoever divorces his wife, except it be for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery, and whoso marries her... Uh, who is put away commits adultery. But again, that's not God's law on marriage. That's God's exception to His law on marriage. God's law on marriage is found in Matthew 19, 4 through 6. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. That's God's law on marriage. Verse 9 is the exception to God's law. On marriage, and then in 1 Corinthians seven, ten, and eleven, Paul uh, Paul uh, attributes these words to the Lord. He says, "To the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, that you know that a wife is not uh, to uh, divorce her husband, and a husband is not to divorce her wife, his wife." He says, he goes on in verse eleven, says, "But if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband." be reconciled to her husband. And that language is very important. But these are the three statements that we find that are either expressly, uh, you might say, there are two of the statements that are in red letters 
And there's a third statement that Paul says, I'm simply telling you what Jesus said. Not necessarily, not necessarily in quoting what Jesus said, but this is what Jesus taught. And that's why it's not in, that's why it's not in, in, in uh, we say not in the red letter portion of the text. And so, and the response of the disciples to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 19, 9 tells us this is a problem. Because when Jesus told those people, including the twelve apostles, that whoever divorces his wife except it be for fornication and marries another commits adultery, the, the immediate response of the disciples was, if, such, if, it, if this is the case, if such is the case with a man and his wife, it's better for him not to marry at all. Now, have you ever thought about that statement? That the twelve apostles... Upon hearing Jesus' statement about divorce and remarriage, their immediate response is, if that's the only reason I can divorce my wife, I'm better off not to ever marry at all. That's what the text said. In other words, we, you know, we, we forget that the apostles had a very low view of marriage, which tells us that the common view of the Jew at that time was very low in regard to the respect for marriage. If we go back 400 years to the last book of the Old Testament and look at Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, God condemns His people uh, and says He will not accept their offerings or their sacrifices based on this, uh, based on this primary problem. You have broken the covenant with the wife of your youth. In other words, you stayed married, and, and you know, and in essence, it's like the wife of your youth is like the first one you married, and then at some point in time, you found a reason to get rid of her and get you another one. And then Malachi 2 says, God hates divorce. God hates divorce. And so, what we see now in our society is nothing new. And it's not even anything new among people who are, are the children of God. And so Jesus is addressing this as, as a very serious problem. Now, the text in our lesson today on the second page, I believe it's the second page, I've already got it turned, let me make sure i got that. Yeah, on the second page of, of our lesson, which is lesson, what's the lesson plan, 25, is that right? Okay. We're going to start on the second page and begin with the statement that is made there, what is adultery? That's a very important question. What is adultery? Johnny. Yeah, Malachi 2. Yeah. Well, yeah, and the, well, and all the way through the Old Testament, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this in this lesson, all throughout the Old Testament, God describes His relationship with His people as a husband and wife. Husband and wife. You know, covenant. You know, you know one to one. You know, till, and this is, till death do us part. And so, just the very language that the prophets used in regard to God and His relationship to His people as equating it to husband and wife is already then is pictured for us, and we see it in Ephesians five. You know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. And so, and so that is, you know, that's absolutely true. And but as we think about the word adultery, the word adultery, it's very important for us to understand what that word means, uh, and be, primarily because some among some among the Lord's people have tried to teach that adultery is nothing more than breaking the marriage vow. In other words, they equate the divorce as being adultery. And, and I know this name won't mean anything to a lot of you, but to some of us old heads it'll mean something. You know, Rubel Shelley came out 
about 30 years ago and tried to defend the notion that adultery is not a sexual word. Those are his exact words. Adultery is not a sexual word. It's simply a, a euphemism for covenant breaking. And yet, if you read, if you do word studies on this word, and by the way, and I don't mean word studies that are done by our, our brethren on the lectureships or at polishing the pulpit. I mean, get out the commentaries. You know, get out the Adam Clarks. You know, get out the uh, you know, get out the Jameson Fawcett and Brown, the Kyle and Delitz. Get out all the get out all the great works uh, of, of of Old Testament commentaries and try to defend that position because it cannot be defended. But why why would a man say why would a man say that the divorce is the adultery? You know, why would he say that? And the reason is. In his mind, you know, what he's trying to do is, if you commit adultery by getting a divorce, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness for what you've done, and then you can do what? You marry again. Now that look, that's the very that's the very heart of his argument. The, the divorce is what takes the divorce is the adultery, and then you ask for forgiveness for that, and then you could go get married again or you might have already married again but you can ask for forgiveness for the adultery for the covenant breaking uh, that you committed earlier on and so but the problem is even the text that Jesus teaches us in the text wherein Jesus teaches us it says in Matthew 19 whoso marries or whoso divorces his wife except it be for fornication and marries another commits adultery. In other words, e even the language of the text doesn't permit the divorce to be the adultery. It would have to be the, it's the marriage that Jesus says that constitutes adultery. And by the way, when he says marriage, he's not talking about the wedding ceremony. He's talking about he's talking about the relationship that the two are living in from the time from the time that they that they remarry, because the the verb there commits adultery is a, uh, is often described as a linear verb. It means it's an ongoing it's an ongoing act. It's not just a simple. Uh, it's not what they say in language discussions. It's not punctilier, which means point in time. In other words, you just did it. You just committed adultery one time by remarrying, and you're not in adultery after that. It's linear. It's an ongoing. It's an ongoing uh, uh, problem with regard to uh, the relationship, the marriage relationship. It's described as being uh, the marriage relationship itself is described as being uh, adultery. Now, in the second, uh, in the second paragraph here on page two. You know, let's look at what the language says. The Greek word for adultery is moikeia, and it, it is the illicit sexual conduct of a married person with another person. Now, again, consider what that says. In order for adultery to take place, one of the individuals has to be married, right? Right? In other words, you can't have adultery without somebody being rightfully joined to another person. So, just to use Rhonda and myself as an example, if I divorce Rhonda and I married somebody who's never been married before, the Bible says I'm still committing adultery, right? Because why? Because I'm still rightfully joined to somebody, and in this case, I'm still rightfully joined to Rhonda. And I think that helps us clear up, clear up the matter of, of, the, of defining the terms. Somebody in that relationship has to be joined to someone else in order for adultery to take place. I mean, that's what the language says. That's what the language says. You know, notes, let the language say... You know, let the text say what it says. And so, if you have two people who are not joined together, who are in an illicit sexual relationship, then how does the Bible, what does the Bible use, what word does the Bible use to describe that? 
Fornication, that's right. Now, fornication is a word. <laughs> this, look, this is going to sound terrible, but just bear with me. <laughs> fornication is a word like the word church. You say, why is fornication like church? Well, here's how it works. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole lot of different ways to use the word church. Ecclesia. Sometimes it refers to the universal church, right? And sometimes it refers to the local church. But sometimes it doesn't refer to a religious gathering at all. For example, in, you know, when Paul was in Ephesus, you know, there, was, there was a riot that was started by an assembly. An assembly. Guess what the word is there? Ecclesia. It's the same word for church. So not only can church be used in two separate religious senses, it can be used in a non-religious sense. And as we always say, context determines meaning. Sometimes the word fornication is used in a very broad way. As, as we might say, as, a, as, a, as an umbrella term, that encompasses every single kind of sexual sin. You know, it, could take, it could take in two unmarried people in an illicit sexual relationship. It can take in an adulterous relationship. It can take in a homosexual relationship. Notice, the word fornication can encompass all of those things. But sometimes the word fornication is more specific. For example, when we see the word fornication in a list of sins, and it starts with fornication, and then followed by adultery, and then uncleanness or lasciviousness, you see. So when fornication is coupled up next side of adultery, and for example, in 1 Corinthians 6, it's coupled up, and I say coupled, it's joined together with fornication, adultery, and homosexuality. So then we know that it's a more specific type of sexual sin. In other words, when it, when it appears in the list alongside other sexual sins, you know to take the narrow understanding of fornication, you see. And so when we look at this word, you know, when we look at the word, we go back to, you know, uh, it says, um, um, Whosoever divorces his wife, except it be for what? Fornication. Which means any type, of, any type of illicit sexual activity is in that text. It's used in the... It's used in the... Uh, uh, it's used... Well, that's not technically correct. Let me back up. It's used in a specific sense to, to deal with any illicit sexual activity. Not just what goes on in a person's head. In other words, when Jesus said, Whosoever divorces his wife except it be for fornication, he's not saying if a man if a man had an had an impure thought about somebody who wasn't his wife, that, that would constitute grounds that would constitute grounds for divorce and remarriage. Now, I said that to get to this point. This is a growing this is a growing problem in the church. This idea that, that divorce can take place simply on the basis of mental infidelity. Now I've had to deal with this, I can't tell you how many times through the years. You know, you know, I, you know, I found pornography on my husband's computer. Can I divorce him and remarry? And my answer is always no. You can't. Because that's not what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 19. He's talking about an action. In other words, there's an action that's being committed. And, 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 and I, you know, I've even heard it in, in recent days that, that people in the church are teaching that if your spouse has, for example, used pornography or has a, a, a porn addiction, that you can divorce them and remarry. And, use, and they use Matthew 19. I don't believe that's what Jesus is talking about. When you start when you start talking about making mental judgments, I mean we're in, you know, we're entering you know, we're entering into an area where we are not qualified to speak or judge. 
But with regard to the physical act, we can judge in that matter, right? Because the physical act has taken place. You know, what, did, what did they say when they brought that woman in John 8? They said, this woman was taken in adultery, what? In the very act. That's right. So even, even those in the, in the first century understood that adultery required an act. An act. And they, and, 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 and they caught her in the very act. And so we want to make sure that we're clear about what, what Jesus intends with regards to, uh, or with regard to what constitutes fornication that permits a person to put away their spouse and marry another. Now I want to uh, uh, look at the uh, still second paragraph. Third line. Moses wrote that a man who commits adultery with another's wife is subject to death. Leviticus 20 and verse 10. Adultery was not just walking out on one's wife. It involved an act with another's wife. Now, in Ezekiel 16.25, Ezekiel 16.25, God describes, God describes their spiritual adultery in terms of physical adultery. And by the way, the language, in, and, and it's written, I mean, they printed it in this book, okay? And, I, and I'm not just reading this for shock value. This is what the text says. It says, You built yourself a high place at the top of every street and made your beauty abominable. And you spread your legs to every passerby to multiply your harlotry. You know, sometimes, sometimes the sometimes the straightforward nature of the biblical text makes us uncomfortable. By the way, I had to read that several times before I felt like I could be comfortable enough to read it in this Bible class. You spread your legs to every person who passes by. Now, the King James says this. You open your feet. Well, what does that mean? Spread your legs. Now, the New King James, well, it's the same thing. Well, 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 well all right, now, you said it sounds nicer. But which one gets the point across better? The, one, the first one I read, that's the one that gets the point across, right? Now, the New King James botched this passage terribly. It said, you offer yourself. Now you ask me, does that sound nicer? But is it accurate? Nope. Doesn't get the point across. That's exactly right. It doesn't get the point across. So, so, I'm just telling you these things that you know, when we study our Bibles, we need to understand the Bible speaks in some extremely explicit language from time to time. And by the way, if I were just going to be honest with you, a lot of what is found in the Song of Solomon has been toned down by, by, the, by the passages. It's my understanding that it's my understanding that Roman Catholicism didn't allow the Song of Solomon to be read aloud in their assemblies because of the explicit nature of of the uh, of the uh, relationship that's in the book, which, by the way, a which was a relationship that was honorable in the eyes of God. But I want you to see here how God describes His people in speaking about their adultery. You know, he's, not, he's not just talking about some, men, some mental state. He said, you've committed adultery and you go out trying to commit. Like That's, why I said that. That's exactly right. He hates it. He hates it. it. Yeah, it angered him. But it's... And, and it's still and it's still accurate. That's exactly that's exactly right. I mean, you got you got to say it the way that it is. You got to say it the way that it is. Now, 
In verse uh, 32, the last uh, line in that paragraph, you adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Now that, that's pretty straightforward. Not as explicit as the previous verse, but he's already, he's, already said, he's already said what he needs to say in verse 25, and the rest of it hinges on that opening statement. And then in our text, Matthew 5, 28, it says, Whoever looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now this goes back to the meaning of the word adultery. What is the man lusting over? Is he lusting over the woman leaving her husband, or is he lusting over the sexual side of that? And obviously the text... The, the question is answered by asking it. We all know that he's not, he's not lusting over a woman leaving her husband. He's lusting over the sexual act that would be involved in, in uh, that, that's already taking place uh, in, his, in his mind. Uh, then I already mentioned John 8 and verse 4, the woman taken in adultery. The next uh, paragraph, how does the adultery defile the bed? There it says, uh, 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 marriage is honorable among all and its bed is undefiled. You know, the marriage bed is undefiled. But fornicators and idolaters, God will judge. All right? And so, uh, and so uh, our fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And so, again, the text is clear. Uh, what's in mind here it's an act it's not just simply a it's not just simply a thought it is an act uh, and then Matthew 5 proves that it's not a point of action or a one time activity uh, because the verb commits adultery is a continual action word it is not something that just happened once but rather continues to happen this is further expressed in Romans 7 and verse 3 it says, so then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. In other words, not just one time, the, the life that she's living as being married to another man while her husband still lives makes her an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's freed from that law and not an adulteress, even though she is joined to another man. Um, and then at the bottom of, at the bottom of this uh, page, it talks about how does one solve the adultery problem? Because there's another error, there's another error that is, has been taught in the brotherhood for a long, long time. And by the way, is standard practice in the religious world at large, outside of the Lord's church. And that is this. Whatever state you're in, when you come to the Lord, you can stay in that state. Now, if, you've been, if you've been divorced unscripturally and remarried and you obey the gospel, when you get baptized, you can stay in that marriage. Or if you've been married five times, well that, whatever one you have, when you obey the gospel, you can bring, you can bring that one in, into, the, into the church. Now, there are a host of problems with that idea. Not the least of which is that baptism does not sanctify sinful relationships. Baptism does not turn sin into license. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, let's just open our Bibles there very quickly, and we'll, we'll close with this text this morning because I know I'm fixing to get a bell and I need to hand out the next set of lessons, even though we probably won't get to them next week. In 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9, Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, for those who want to take a couple living in adultery and say that when you obey the gospel, you get to keep, you get to keep the spouse that you've got, even if you were living in adultery at the time of your obedience. How many of these other things in this list get washed away? If you're a drunkard, if you're a drunkard when you obey the gospel, does that mean you get to keep on drinking? 
Why not? If, it, if it's good for the adulterer, it's good for the drunkard. How about this one? And by the way, ten years ago, I would have said nobody in the church would have accepted this, but so many of our people have lost their ever-loving minds, I'd be afraid to speak to it. But since it's legal for two men to get married, or two women to get married, and they want to obey the gospel, do they get to stay married? Is there, is their marriage any more or less legitimate in the eyes of God than the adulterous marriage? Hmm. It's not. So if you make an exception for one sin in in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, you've got to make an exception for all of them. So now, what's the solution for that? Well, what does repentance require? I got to turn from it, and if that's a sin, I got to I got to stop committing it. And by the way, there is Bible for that. Even back in the days of the Old Testament, in Ezra chapter ten, when the exiles were coming out of Babylonian captivity, the text says that they admitted to Ezra that they had taken wives which were not lawful for us to have. In other words, we've got wives that the Word of God expressly says we cannot have. What was their solution? It says, we will put away these wives from among us. We will put away these wives from among us. And by the way, Ezra said, oh no, you don't have to do that. You're sorry. You're sorry for what you did, and that's good enough. Nope. They put those wives away. By the way, some of those men who had unscriptural wives were priests. And then, to, to counteract the, the emotional appeal, it says at the end of Ezra chapter 10, about verses 42, 43, 44, they put away their wives, some of whom they had children with. How many times do we hear, oh, God wouldn't want, God wouldn't want a, a marriage dissolved if children were involved. If children are involved, God would never want that. Can't prove it by the Bible. That's the first thing. That's it. Yeah. But here's the, what about the sin? That's the question that has to be asked. What about the sin? Not what about the children. What about the sin? Ezra 10, 42 to 44 is clear. I mean, and, it's almost, and it's almost like Ezra is making sure that we understand they weren't just willy-nilly putting away wives that they weren't happy with. They were putting away wives that they were not lawfully allowed to have and they had children by those, by those wives. And they did so with God's blessing. In fact, they understood they could not be the pure people of God so long as, so long as they continued in those relationships. All right. The last verse is about five, I guess. Kind of explain. Be ye therefore perfect as the Father is perfect. That's right. All right. Uh, Lord willing, next Sunday, which is what? Is that the third? We'll start with adultery separates and destroys and do the questions and then move into uh, lesson plan 26. And I'm going to take, take the in-between bell time to get these handed out and leave the rest on the back.